as in 1962, so now we are talking about creating direct threats to Russia's security right at our borders. Today it is even closer than the Jupiters located in Turkey. If we talk about the Caribbean crisis, why did the U.S. try to place missiles in close proximity to our borders? How did the Soviet Union face the deployment of medium-range missiles in Turkey in the 1960s? The U.S. didn't just try, they actually deployed Jupiter medium-range missiles in Turkey and Italy. I mention Italy because the range of these missiles launched from this country covered a significant part of European territory. From Turkey to Moscow, a little more than 10 minutes of flight, as they thought then. This was the beginning of the Caribbean crisis, and not the way Western historiography tries to present it, which sees the root of the problem in the deployment of our missiles in Cuba. There we only responded to what the United States had already done near the Soviet Union. If we ignore the problem of the threat of U.S. aggression against Cuba, it was quite real, appropriate attempts were made, then the main thing from a military strategic point of view was the fact of deployment, nuclear weapons, of the United States in close proximity to the borders of the USSR. At that time, the United States, in addition to the Jupiters, possessed nuclear warheads in the amount of four and a half thousand, which was several times greater than the total number of nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union. An important factor was also that the Jupiter, according to its characteristics, was regarded in the USSR and in the West as a means of first strike. With this in mind, the decisions that were taken then were based on real-life security threats to our country. The extent to which the United States took the situation seriously is evidenced by the recollections of eyewitnesses about the conversation between President John F. Kennedy and his assistants in the Oval Office. The head of the White House said that he did not understand why Khrushchev should deploy missiles in Cuba. After all, the Soviet leader, they say, should have been aware that for the United States it would be the same if the Americans deployed their missiles in Turkey. The assistant told him with surprise that this was exactly what the United States had done. I hope that in today's situation, President Joe Biden will have more opportunities to understand who gives orders and how. How similar are the situations in the 1960s and the situation now in the event of an escalation of the conflict with Ukraine? Both there and there, it is clearly seen that the United States is trying to be the hegemon. To what extent can the experience of our living through the Caribbean crisis help here and now? There are similarities. As in 1962, so now it is about creating direct threats to Russia's security right on our borders. Today it is even closer than the Jupiters located in Turkey. There is a military campaign to pump up Ukraine with all kinds of weapons. There is serious talk about the need to strengthen the nuclear capabilities of NATO in addition to the five countries that already have American tactical nuclear weapons on their territory. Poland is asking for a candidate for the Americans to also place their nuclear bombs there. This situation is very worrying. 
The difference is that back in 1962, Khrushchev and Kennedy found the strength to show responsibility and wisdom, and now we do not see such readiness on the part of Washington and its satellites. Lots of examples. You can start with the fact that the chance for negotiations that appeared at the end of March of this year, at a meeting in Istanbul, was destroyed, now we can say this, on the direct instructions of Washington. The United States, NATO, the European Union continue to talk about the need to defeat Russia on the battlefield. As you rightly pointed out, behind all of this is the absolute inability of the United States to give up the desire to rule everything and everyone. If at one time they sang, rule, Britain, the seas, now America wants to sing, for sure, rule, America, the planet. President of Russia Putin spoke about this clearly, clearly, unambiguously in his speech in the Kremlin, when the treaties between Russia and the four new subjects of the Federation were signed. This is where the main difference lies. Will Europe have enough responsibility? After all, Europeans are already suffering from economic sanctions many times more than the United States. There is a growing number of economists not only here, but also in the West, who come to the conclusion that the goal of the United States is to completely bleed and de-industrialize the European economy. The Germans are moving a large number of their production to the US, with all the ensuing consequences for the long-term competitiveness of the European Union. It is also in Washington's interests to weaken Europe militarily, constantly keep it in suspense, force it to pump weapons into Ukraine, in return to fill the EU countries' arms depots with American supplies. We all understand this. It combines economic, purely selfish calculations and ideological complexes of superiority. There is such a point of view that in the 1960s, decisions were made by people who went through World War II and understood what that meant. Now in America, decisions are made by politicians who in principle did not sniff gunpowder, and this is more dangerous, because to understand the consequences of the war is still sobering. What do you think about it? This is a universal theme not only for Americans, but also for Europeans. Yes, and we no longer have politicians who directly participated in the war. The difference lies in the fact that a significant number of our citizens come from families that somehow participated in the great patriotic war, suffered, lost loved ones. Because of the huge number of victims and the strength of sacrifice demonstrated by the Soviet multinational people, this memory is sacred. This is what distinguishes us from those who begin to treat the topic of nuclear weapons lightly. Joe Biden himself was born during World War II. He remembers that in the post-war years this topic was seriously discussed. Then it still influenced the American political class. At the same time, all the other members of the administration are people who do not have this memory either. At the very least, this can be inferred from their actions in fomenting a confrontation with Russia, on the assertion that, if Ukraine does not win, then this is unacceptable, and much more. In Europe, there have also appeared figures who are trying rather irresponsibly to play with the topic of nuclear weapons. In February of this year, Le Drian, then Foreign Minister of France, reminded that Russia should not forget that NATO also has nuclear weapons. 
Commander-in-Chief of the German Air Force Gerhardt suddenly said that NATO should prepare for a nuclear war and the use of nuclear weapons. Addressing the head of the Russian state Putin, he said that our president should not dare to compete with them. From the lips of a German, this is a very revealing statement. For a long time, long before the start of the special military operation, we began to feel in contact with our German colleagues that they were conveying a clear idea through various methods and in different expressions. Dear colleagues, we Germans have paid everyone for everything and no longer owe anything to anyone. Therefore, stop reproaching us for what happened during World War II. This is a rather dangerous trend. Now many in Germany, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs, trying to claim that the Germans will never forget the crimes that these people committed during the reign of Hitler during the Third Reich, but at the same time they continue to claim that they have paid off with everyone. I do not take into account the topic of reparations, which now, following Poland, the Greeks have begun to raise to the shield. I am talking about the responsibility for the peaceful development of the continent and for the non-rebirth of Nazism, which unfortunately is now being revived quite quickly, primarily in the very Ukraine supported by the Germans. President Zelensky's statement that it was a mistake to renounce nuclear weapons, he made it in February this year, did not provoke any condemning reaction from his Western backers. What should we do? During the Caribbean crisis, as you said, Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy came to an agreement. In your opinion, how can the escalation of the conflict be reduced so that Russia can preserve its legal personality, national security, and isolation? What to do if Western partners do not go to negotiations? President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly said that we have never refused and do not refuse negotiations. He warned that those who refuse, this is done by Ukraine on the direct instructions of Western sponsors, should understand, the longer they delay negotiations, the more difficult it will be for them to negotiate with us. In his speech in the Kremlin on September 30th this year, Vladimir Putin once again called on the Kiev regime to stop hostilities and sit down at the negotiating table. The West once again missed it past the ears, and Zelensky said that he was not going to talk with the current president of Russia. He even signed a decree that forbids him to do so. He is an artist of the comedy genre, but now it's not up to comedies. The events in Ukraine take a tragic turn because of what is happening with this regime, which enjoys absolute impunity from the West. The readiness of Russia, including its President Vladimir Putin, for negotiations remains unchanged. Over the past six months, there have been several initiatives from the Americans and some other Western colleagues who have asked for telephone conversations with the Russian leader. Some foreign ministers have approached me with the same request. We have always agreed, we will always be ready to listen to possible proposals to reduce the tension of our Western colleagues. Since February 2014, we have not seen any activity in this direction. When the bloody coup d'etat was organized, the very first instinct of the new government was to demand that the status of the Russian language in Ukraine be eliminated, enshrined in laws, that Russians be expelled from Crimea, and so on. For seven long years after the conclusion of the Minsk agreements, all our reminders, calls to ensure that the Kiev regime complied with them, ran into a wall of silence. 
Apparently, the calculation was then that Zelensky would be able to restore his territorial integrity by force. He did not hide this, that in Kiev they intend to do this. In fact, the Ukrainian president began to implement this Plan B when in February this year. Repeatedly more intense shelling of Donbass began. This was the last straw that overflowed the cup of patience. We couldn't decide otherwise to protect those people. We are always ready to listen to our Western colleagues if they make another request to arrange a conversation. I hope that in addition to reproducing in contacts through diplomatic departments and through other channels what they say publicly in propaganda further, they will be able to offer us some serious approaches that will help to diffuse tension and fully take into account the interests of the Russian Federation and its security. For decades we have tried to formalize this by international legal methods. The last time such an attempt was made in December 2021, when we proposed to the Americans and NATO a European security treaty aimed at ensuring the legitimate interests in this area of all European countries, including Ukraine without membership in the North Atlantic Alliance and the interests of the Russian Federation. If we are approached with realistic proposals based on the principles of equality and mutual respect of interests, aimed at finding compromises and a balance of interests of all countries in this region, we will succeed, as has always been the case in the past.